beginning with verse number one. As we work toward the conclusion of this lesson series. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. For by it, meaning faith, for by it the elders <coughs> obtained a good report. Verse 3, through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. If you've been waiting for this series to end, you got your wish today. <laughs> Faith over flesh come to the conclusion of what I labeled an exegetical expose of Hebrews chapter 11. This is the concluding part, which is part 20, a look at flesh, faith, worship, and love. Clearly there are enough indicators in our lives and in our world to help the concept of faith become a magnified element as well as a necessary element in our lives. Again, the Hebrew writer in the same chapter said, without faith it's impossible to please him. He that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently, with scrutiny, with scrutiny, they diligently seek him. So again, as we conclude this message, and I'll try to be, I'm, I'm going to try to be timely. <laughs> My keynote presentation at Palm Springs was very interesting. Because they had a time. <coughs> So on the stage, my presentation was 90 minutes. So I said up front, you guys really want me to speak for 90 minutes? About 90 minutes, but as you walk on the stage, right in front of you, as soon as I hit the podium, boom, I can see the countdown start from 90 minutes. Because I always talk about church, I said, my congregation might wish we have one of these. Yeah. <laughs> so instead of me watching the clock go around, watch it count down, it, it might help. We'll try to be somewhat timely uh, today, but I'm not totally sure what that, what that means. I think we have enough information for two hours, so if I give you one hour, that's timely. <laughs> <laughs> so concluding this message, uh, we establish again the necessity of faith and that all that is happening in our world, in our nation, it requires faith. I don't know how you make it through. <coughs> without faith. That's right. Because without a faith in God, then you and I are forced to figure out things on our own mm -hmm. and to resolve things on our own. All right. mm -hmm. Because if there is no faith in God, then that means it's left up to you and I mm -hmm. to fix it. Mm -hmm. But we don't operate as divinity. So the way we might resolve something is not the way God would resolve something. That's right. Now I think we, we may have spoken about this a bit last week, not totally sure, uh, but for me there's now a certain level of hopelessness 
that exist towards our world. And someone might look at that up front and say, well, that doesn't sound right for the child of God. Because the child of God should never assume a posture or a disposition of hopelessness. But understand that it's a hopelessness in man. A hopelessness in woman. But an absolute hope in God. Who has the ability to change hopeless man. And hopeless woman into that which is absolutely hopeful. So again, we have to make sure we put our minds in the right place. Because if we're expecting for humanity to fix something, mm. you might be waiting for quite some time, but what we're really looking at is we're, we're, we're looking forward to Jesus yeah. mm. to be the ultimate solution as well as the ultimate answer. Now I gave this to you, gave this to you last week, and as I got in the car this morning to drive to the meeting house of the saints, turned on the radio and immediately heard that the death toll has now gone from seven to ten. Because first we had two African American men killed by the police. We could add three, but one they're not talking about as much. We have two African American men killed at the hands of the police, Baton Rouge as well as Minnesota. We had last week, uh, sometime or the week before that, the five Dallas officers uh, killed. And then from what I heard this morning, we have now three more police officers killed last night or this morning in Baton Rouge. So again, our nation is in an uproar. And things are coming off the hinges. So we have now from a public perspective, 10 dead, which then still starts this cycle all over again. And I was wondering even, as preachers were having the conversations last week about whether or not they should preach about the injustices going on in our nation, my wonder also was how many would come back to the conversation this week? just a fly-by-night type of thing. Right. The media is captivated by it, so now our churches should be captivated by it. Well, what happens when the media stops talking? Come on. Come on. Even though the dynamics are still happening, do we then go silent? So there's still that, that, that question and that scenario of the fact that our nation is surrounded by racism and injustice. Now, every Every nation has their thing. Every nation has, you just saw Brit Exit or whatever they're calling, every nation is dealing with something. That's right, man. That's right. In America, part of our ill is we still have not fully and with deep conviction, number one, we haven't shown the right level of contrition. Yeah. And we still have not assessed dialogued, put the right and necessary action toward our racial injustice dilemma. It, that's America's issue. That's right. That we still have not put the right attention into fixing that particular problem. And it's also a problem that plagues our churches. Right. It's not a situation that where if we go silent on it, somehow it goes away or it's not happening. Even many of our doctrinal issues that we are fussing and fighting over still have their hand rooted in a racial dynamic. Mm. Because that which we embrace as that which is appropriate culturally then gets transferred into what is appropriately and correct doctrinally. All right. So the way in which you govern yourself, the way in which you comport yourself, don't, so, don't say amen in too loud of a fashion. Ah. And somehow that then becomes something that is now uh, out of doctrine or out of character or something that is unscriptural, when in actuality it just may not be the right thing culturally based upon the type of culture you subscribe to. Yeah. But to turn that into a book, chapter, and verse dynamic is to fall right into the same system of how we must be judged, how we must
must comport ourselves because apparently there is a dominant society that tells us what is right. That's right. So we have all of these things going on. And then we find ourselves, even from a church perspective, having these conversations or refusing to have these conversations. So then we have this reality of what is the church's role? The church should stay out of it. That would mean the church does not care about the mistreatment of people in the world. And it would also or also assumes the fact that if there are injustices in the world, somehow, once you become a member of the church, you are now immune to those injustices. Come on now. So if there is a racial and a racist situation that plagues our nation, then that means there are those in society that are being ill impacted, be, being ill impacted by that, and the church doesn't care because the church stays silent and out of the issue. But then there are issues we want to speak on. Uh -huh. Then it also means that there must not be anybody in the church that is also on the wrong side of the equation. And if there are people that are on the wrong side of the equation, perhaps we are saying, well, they're not worth enough to address it. So then there is the frequency of the message. How often? How often will we talk about it? See, part of the problem is, every time we talk about race and injustice, it's presented as a standalone. Mm -hmm. So in other words, mm -hmm. because it is a conversation we so seldomly have, when we have it, number one, we ask, are we allowed? Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. Are we allowed in the diverse church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to have a conversation that pinpoints that pinpoint race and racism? So number one, we're asking under that context, is this an injustice that the church has permission to address? Mm -hmm. In addition to that, if, if we don't continue down that line, then we're asking, well, well, how frequently should we have the conversation? But the reality is, we have the conversation so infrequently that when we do have it, it seems like we're not supposed to bring it up. Come mm -hmm. on. It needs to become a normalized aspect of how we do business contained within the gospel message. Yeah. So that it's being addressed, that sin and, and, and racism is being addressed as a sinful practice, just like every other sin. Yeah. 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 But because we're so afraid to have that conversation, when we have it, we don't know how to engage. It. And we don't know if it's even appropriate to have it. Then, of course, the gospel of God, the gospel of Christ is his, his power to save. So Jesus has always had a message. Through the Hebrew writer, again, faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God based upon the apostle Paul. So I cannot develop faith without first of all hearing a word That's right. mm. from God. Mm. And then the Hebrew writer is telling us that faith is now the substance of things hoped for, the convicted evidence of things not seen. That the only way to make it through the minutia of all of this is to have an unrelenting faith in the one that has the power to bring resolve, even if not from a public perspective in your mind. Mm. To bring to you a type of necessary understanding to help you better navigate, and help me better navigate the world in which I live. Mm. But again, we're asking, does this gospel message, is, is it relevant in the areas of injustice? Or is it only relevant in the areas of other forms of injustice that don't include race? But as I scroll the scriptures, I see that Jesus always had a word for the oppressed. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Remember in John 
chapter 2. When Jesus walks into the temple and he's infuriated over the fact that they have turned his father's house yeah. into a den of thieves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jesus did not like the injustice mm -hmm. that was taking place in his father's house. Mm -hmm. He didn't have a problem with them selling what they were selling because what they were selling was needed for the sacrifice. Right. He didn't like the fact that they were being overcharged. Yeah. Mm. Come on, brother. Jesus has never appreciated people being abused. Yes, sir. Preach, preach. He never appreciated people intentionally marginal marginalizing someone else. That's right. When Jesus saw the poor, he took care of the poor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When Jesus saw the sick, he took care of the sick. When Jesus saw the deaf, he took care of the deaf. When Jesus saw the mute, he took care of the mute. When yes. Jesus saw the little children being refused and, and being denied his presence, he said, back up. Yes, sir. Mm. Let them come to me. Yes, sir. So the Jesus that I know of the scriptures, anytime he saw injustice, he had a word for them. Amen. As we talked about last, last Lord's Day, when they brought the woman caught in the very act of adultery. He knew that their minds were unjust. He knew that they had no compassion for the lady. So therefore, he flipped the script and said, whoever is without sin, cast. Yeah, right, right. Throw the first stone. Whoever is guiltless, throw the first, the first stone. So now, we're, we're in this dilemma where Again, it's about silence. <clears throat> so we have a situation where we're not really sure what to say. Do we have permission to say anything? And there are multiple nuances that happen within the psychological processing of this notion of silence. Because for many generations ago, silence equals safety. Mm. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Keeping my mouth closed right. 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 meant I stay safe. Yeah. So my great great grandfather and great 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 grandfather might walk with his grandson. See an injustice, a racial injustice. Yeah. But instead of addressing that injustice, would vocalize and model to his grandson, shh, don't say a word. Mm -hmm. But Grandpa, they just, shh, don't say a word. Because if your rebuttal or if your retort is heard, mm -hmm. It could equal death. That's right. Mm. So shh. Silence now equals safety. As you fast forward, there's still some with the mentality, yes. the inherited mentality that silence equals safety. Right. So you have on one side silence equals safety, and on another side, silence equals violence. Mm. Because if you don't speak, it's perpetually. Right, right. So I'm on the plane, and I'm reading my book. Talked about this encounter in the 1950s or 60s. So a man is being looked for to be lynched. Mm -hmm. They can't find him. So they find another man that they knew had a problem with the guy they were trying to vindicate. He hadn't done anything. But they find him, they lynch him. His name was Mr. Turner, I believe. His wife then springs into action to try and vindicate her husband legally. You lynched my husband. I'm now fighting back. She was eight months pregnant. 
They took Miss Turner, hung her up upside down, doused her with gasoline, set her ablaze. While she's burning, a lady in the mob got the bright idea of getting a blade. Wow. Sliced her across her stomach. Out fall, I'm not making this up. Mm. Out fall, 50s or 60s. Mm. Out falls the eight month fetus. Mm. Wow. The crowd then proceeds to stomp the baby to death. Wow. That's designed to say, now if you talk, you will be next. Mm -hmm. The next person that tries to vindicate another person, wow. this too will be your fate. Mm -hmm. So some in society soon learn. Mm -hmm. Shh. Don't talk. Mm -hmm. So then we end up right where we are. Okay. Where we end up with African American men mm. murdered by police. A good 
reputation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By faith we understand that the entire universe, the entire universe was full at God's command. That what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. Mm -hmm. Now, at some point we have to then define what this faith element is. Because second to the death of Christ on the cross, there is nothing more radical in the Christian faith and under the Christian religion than the notion of faith. Because it is helping us realize that if God was able to frame the world, and we could not see God, but God could frame the world based upon his spoken word, then faith is also having the same level of, of, of conviction, belief, and trust in God, knowing that he can speak a word into your life and my life to resolve whatever we're dealing with as well. Amen. Amen. Doesn't mean that he will fix it for everybody, but there are times where God does nothing to the circumstances of your environment, but just does a bunch of internal work on you. Yeah. Right? Yeah, right. So that that which is going around you and, and, and is, 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 is circling your life is no longer destroying your life because you come to a place of peace and understanding in your mind and God says that's all you're going to get so right now. Right. Right. I'm not fixing what's outside your door but I am going to fix what's in your mind. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Amen. See that's true spirituality. Yes, mm -hmm. To where all the circumstances didn't change but yeah. I changed. Yes, yes, sir. And that doesn't mean you went silent. Yeah. It just means now you have a divine understanding about what's happening and you know that there's nothing you can physically do. It's all about what God will do. Yeah. 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 So again, what is this notion of, of faith? Coming from the Greek word pistis, meaning belief with the predominant idea of trust or confidence whether in God or in Christ springing from faith in the same. So faith is a radical concept because it deals with belief, it deals with trust, and it deals with confidence, but this is confidence that is rooted in God. That's right. It also equates to the essence of what it means to be persuaded. Mm. You and I cannot be people of faith if we have not been persuaded That's right. by the way of God. If, if you are still in the mindset of waiting to be persuaded, That's right. mm. you haven't come to faith yet. That's right. But for those who, who are truly in God's kingdom, we live by Christ and under the concept of faith because we have been persuaded that our way is no good and his way is divine. That's right. Persuasion, which equates to credence, Moral conviction, truthfulness of God, especially reliance upon Christ for salvation, assurance, belief, to believe, to have faith, and to operate with fidelity. Mm. We talked about this a lot before in the past where we know more about infidelity Say it. Huh? Say it. than we do about the term fidelity. That's right. <laughs> we know what it means to break trust. Yeah and to be superficial, and to be in and out, than what it means to operate under fidelity, which is to stay the course. That's right. right. That's right. So faith is also the concept not operating through infidelity, but working through fidelity, that I will continue the pace, and not just when I'm feeling good. Yeah. But faith says, I will, I will stay on this path, even when I am not feeling good. Yeah. Right. Right. We're moving forward, moving forward, just give you a bit more review here. Uh, uh, Hebrews 11, 34, and then we'll look at verses 38 through 40. As we concluded this chapter, and as we briefly make our way to the introductory elements of, of, of Hebrews 12, the Hebrew writer says, these people who operated based upon faith, they quenched the violence of fire, mm -hmm. escaped the edge of the sword. Mm. This, this, this phrase is critical. Out of weakness, Amen. we're made strong. Strong. Don't give up when you're weak. Yes, sir. Know that you're about to be made strong. Yes, sir. Wax valiant and fight. Turn to turn 
to flight the armies of the aliens. Look at verse 38. Jump to 38. Of whom, as we said last week, of whom the world was not worthy. Not worthy. Yes, sir. They, they, they wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves and the caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report, how? Through faith, yeah. received not the promise. Mm -hmm. So King James is a little bit tricky with verse 40. But it says, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, New Living Translation puts it this way. For God has something better in mind for us, so that they would not reach perfection without us. Mm -hmm. In other words, God was waiting to perfect you yeah. before he could perfect his kingdom looking back. Right. You got the ultimate form of salvation, oh, and now all of that is passed backwards. Yes, sir. Amen. To yes, all sir. the faithful that live. So, so for us to not operate under faith today would truly be a slap in the face yeah. toward God. So again, Amen. all of this as we look at in Hebrews 11 is really just a exegetical setup for us to understand Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 11 is designed to inspire us yeah. to live by faith yeah. Come on. based upon a case study analysis of other individuals Amen. who believe in the same God yeah. that also walk by faith. Yeah. Yeah. So through, through Hebrews 11, he's trying to provide and is providing inspiration. He's also trying to provide and paint a picture of fellowship that no, you are not alone. That you are still living and breathing. There are some who were killed. That's right. For the very faith and belief you have in God, there are some who had that same belief and it cost them their life. But even in death, they stayed. Yes, sir. Faith. You're talking about being touched in this way, touched in that way, that pales in comparison to what your, your religious kinfolk went through. But through inspiration, he's saying, maintain, maintain the faith. Mm -hmm. So there's this perpetual glaring faith that really deals with the concept, church, of what are you looking for? Mm -hmm. mm. Faith requires a state. Mm -hmm. All right. Some of us are staring at the wrong thing. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Asking for faith. Come on. Gazing in the wrong direction. That's right. Mm. Faith requires an undistracted glare yeah. at the right essence. Mm. How can you say, God, please, please fix? God is over here. Mm. Trouble is over there. God, please fix me. Mm. No, no, God, what, what are you waiting on, God? Please, please fix me. God say, can I get your attention? Mm. Yeah, amen. Uh, if you won't even look at me, yeah. Lord. how are you expecting me to heal? Mm. If you won't even stare in my direction. Yeah. Oh, not just on Sunday. Mm. Come on now. Mm. Not just for 60 to 90 minutes on Wednesday. Mm. But if you won't even stare at me as a holistic reality of your life, what is it that you're really expecting mm -hmm. from me? Hebrews 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. Here the Bible says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Yes, sir. That word witnesses in the Greek is really a transliteration because the word in our English is martyr. Mm -hmm. So he's talking about individuals who willingly gave up their life or put themselves in danger just to be an example for us. Mm -hmm. And we can read about them today and understand we're not alone. Mm -hmm. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great, he says, let us lay aside Every weight. Say it. Say it. He's saying lay aside 
in the Greek everything that hinders you. But a more precise word is lay aside everything that encumbers you. Everything that weighs you down. God says every weight lay it aside, every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. That phraseology in the Greek easily beset also means skillfully. So that thing that is so easily besetting to us, oh, it's not simple. It's a complex, strategic package that comes with great skill. Yes, sir. The devil has taken time out to appropriately cultivate a package that skillfully gets to your flesh. Yes, that's right. That's right. Oh, he didn't just throw a bunch of stuff out and say, we'll just see which one sticks. No, he spent some time understanding what kind of darkness you like. Come on. Yep. Oh yeah, he spent some time assessing what your flesh gravitates towards. It is a skillful operation. Man. That's right. So he's telling us, lay aside every weight and the sin which does so skillfully mm -hmm. beset us. Mm -hmm. He says, and let us run. Mm -hmm. But then he tells us, he says in the Greek, let us run with patience. Now, you know, we preach sermons before, but who do I have about this race that we're running? Mm -hmm. Well, understand that this particular paradigm is, is nestled within the reality of faith where it's talking about survival. Mm -hmm. So there is nothing casual about this race. This is not where you put in mind the casual slow trot of the marathon. Wow. Because this was this one is in light of, based upon your faith and allowing your faith to remain intact, this one is based upon, if we're going to put faith over flesh, this one is not about a slow trot. Mm -hmm. This one is based upon the fact that somebody is skillfully after you. That's right. Now I don't know. I don't know how you grew up. How you were raised, I don't know if you've ever been chased or who you were chased by. Yeah. Amen, lights. Right. Right. Yeah. But based upon my recollection, <laughs> when being chased, it was not a casual job. Right. Right. If you right. needed to hop a fence, you hopped the fence. Yes, sir. If you needed to duck behind a car for a second and then take off again, you were in hot pursuit yes. of trying to reach safety. Yes, yes sir. That's right. That's right. Nothing cute about it. Right. You didn't stop because there was a group standing over there. Hey, Amar, where are you going? No. Yes, sir. You're running to safety. So, so here, the Hebrew writer is saying, lay aside every weight and the sin which does so skillfully or easily beset us. Let us run. This is a flat out sprint. All right. Amen. All right. This is a li Olympiad. Reality here, where you are to run as fast yeah. and with as much strength yeah. as you can. This is not the running to where you just keep running to stay in the race. No, this is the running that you're doing also with, it says patience, but it's really endurance. So this is talking about keep sprinting, but while you're sprinting, stay endured. Maintain your stamina. Why? The chase is not over. Yeah. So we have some people in the faith that are jogging mm. when they should be sprinting. Mm. Mm. They're running slowly around the track as if they cannot see what's behind them. Amen. They cannot see. They cannot detect the danger. But here, he, we've already been inspired by the fact that we need to have faith. And now when we move into Hebrews 12, he's telling us what this faith should look like and how this faith should operate. That we are to lay aside every encumbrance and the sin and the transgressions and the violations that we commit that so easily or skillfully beset us and let us sprint this race let us sprint this race with endurance, the race that is set before us. Now look at verse 2. Turn your Bibles if it's not on your screen, or there it is on your screen. He's saying in verse number 2, looking unto Jesus. Yes. 
It means to stare in an undistracted fashion mm, 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 mm. at Christ. Wow. He's saying if you are going to have faith, number one, it is to be typified by you and I based upon faith over flesh. Running, sprinting, with endurance. And while we are running, looking, staring, without distraction, at Jesus. Yeah. Who are you looking at? This faith premise? Faith process? Now, now, now. Certain segments of our society is taboo to stare. Right? It's taboo to get too close. Mm -hmm. Hold on, man, back up. <laughs> we're five feet. We could be in the same vicinity, but you're just a little too close. Yeah. We have situations all the time in education where, where some of our educators uh, misread the key. And they go stand over a student. Mm -hmm. For some students, it's culturally inappropriate to be that close. Yeah. So they respond with a man. <laughs> Next thing you know, you assaulted me. <laughs> no, you misread the cultural clue. <laughs> You had no business standing and you're touching. Yeah. Wow. Mm. This requires a glaring stare. But in our society, to stare is sometimes taboo. Yeah. So people look and then look away. Mm -hmm. God is saying, for me, for God above, you are to look. And there's nothing else you need to look at. Mm. Amen. What, 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 what else is there for you to glare at? Because you need to maintain your focus. Yes. Because while we are running this race, there will already be enough distractions. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before, mm -hmm. who for the joy that was set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author, the perfecter, and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him did what? Endure. That's right. Dealt with. Right. Internalized the cross. Look at what he did. Despising the shame. And he sat down at the right hand of God and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, verse 3, we'll look at it two ways. New Living and King James. But verse 3, as you see on the screen, for consider him that endured such contradiction. In other words, I'm suffering for right. I'm not suffering because I did something wrong. I'm suffering because I've done everything right and therefore I'm enduring this contradiction. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your mind. In other words, you take your eyes off Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Take your eyes off what you should be focused on, and now suddenly I'm weary. That's right. Mm -hmm. Now suddenly I'm fatigued. Mm -hmm. Because the message is contained inside who you're focused on. That's right. God is saying, as long as you are staring at me, as long as you are focused on me, you will always under a faith over flesh area. Yes, sir. But the minute you stop looking at me and stop looking at him or start looking at her or start looking at that or start looking at the money or start looking at the job, that's when you become fatigued. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Amen. That's when things begin to seem unfair yeah. because you stop looking at Ooh, Jesus right. and you start looking at society. Word. He says here in verse 3, New Living Translation, Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Well, that's right. He says, then you won't become weary. And yes, yes. yes. All right. Verse 4, after all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. Amen. Church, where are you? Faith over flesh. Who are you looking at? 
Because as you stare at God, he won't say, all right, that's enough. You've been looking long enough. He understands that as, oh, you're persuaded. You know who you're looking at. You know who you're watching. And as long as we keep our eyes on Jesus, we'll be successful. In conclusion, Hebrews 4, 412, and this is really setting us up for our series that will begin in August, God willing. Hebrews 412, under the notion of Christian, Christian symmetry. Knowing that we are a complex creation. And God gives us the ability to operate under some complex circumstances. Meaning, as we just discussed, God can have us mentally and spiritually and psychologically at peace. Yes, sir. While everything around us is chaos. That's right. God can even have us mentally, spiritually, and psychologically at peace when even within our physical bodies it is chaotic. Yes, the spiritual composition and way in which God has made us. Come on now. We are designed to be driven by the health of our spirit and our faith. All right. Yeah. All right. Which means that even as my body physically can start to fail, That's right. my spirit can still thrive. Yeah. 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 God has made me to where every piece is not dependent on the other piece. Yes, sir. That as long as my faith is in order, my faith has the business and the ability to override that which might be in me or around me that is now out of order. All right. Say that. However, mm -hmm. the word of God is so strong mm -hmm. that it also comes with a package of symmetry. Mm -hmm. Meaning that there are times where our faith in God can be so strong that it not only speaks to our soul, yes. but it also speaks to our spirit. Yes, sir. And it also speaks to our physical body. So everything is moving in symmetry. Right. That's how powerful the word is. Right. So there are times where, yes, I'm, 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 no, spiritually I'm doing well, but if you were to say, how am I doing at my job? Oh, it's an absolute wreck. Mm. Right, right. But the word also has the ability to where I can say, not only am I well spiritually, I'm well everywhere that I am. Yes, sir. Because internally, I'm spiritually well. And that out of darkness, placed into his marvelous light, he now expects us to engage in kingdom, familial behavior. Mm. There might be someone here who's not a member of the body of Christ. Come by faith. You know who Jesus is. You know what he died for. You know what he suffered for. You know why his father resurrected him. Come to him fully believing in that. Repenting of all your past wicked ways. Confessing the sweetest name on mortal tongue. Submitting yourself to baptism. For the remission of your sins. Coming up a new creation in Christ Jesus. Being endowed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. Living a new life. Representing Jesus Christ as the Son of God. If you are a member of the body of Christ. But you just haven't been living right. Get back in line. It's faith over flesh. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. He that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. Respond together. We stand to him.